All right, tonight, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. You don't even know how nice it is to say those words tonight. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes because for a long time I've been turning over in my mind the message of this book and the more I turn it over in my mind, the more I feel that it is an amazingly appropriate message, not only for our generation, but especially for our generation. And so, Father, we pray that tonight, as we come into your word, you'd pour out your blessing upon us and teach us, Lord, through the preacher of Ecclesiastes, and most of all, by the presence of your living and powerful spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. The book of Ecclesiastes begins with those few words. The words of the preacher. Now the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the most unusual and perhaps difficult to understand books of the Bible. It has over it basically a spirit of hopeless despair. It has no praise in it, no peace to speak of, and it seems to promote questionable conduct. Yet these words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes show us the futility of a life that's lived without an eternal perspective. You, you see, it's a fascinating question that's raised in the book of Ecclesiastes. Not so much the question of whether or not there is a God. No, no the author of Ecclesiastes is no atheist. God is always there. No, the question is not whether or not there is a God. The question is, does God matter? And the answer to that question is vitally connected with the responsibility to God that we have that goes beyond this earthly life. And in searching for the answer throughout this book, the preacher, as it's mentioned right there in verse 1, the words of the preacher, the preacher is going to plumb the depths, search the depths of human experience, including despair. He's going to thoroughly examine the emptiness and the futility of a life that's lived without an eternal perspective before finally coming to the conclusion of the necessity of an eternal perspective. I like this from the commentator Derek Kidner. He says this, We face in Ecclesiastes the appalling inference that nothing has meaning. Nothing matters under the sun. It is then we can hear as the good news which it is that everything matters. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that's how the book of Ecclesiastes ends. But friends, it's quite a road that we're going to travel over the next few weeks until we get to the end. Can I tell you, I'll summarize the book of Ecclesiastes for you right now. It's 11 and a half chapters of hopeless despair and then the answer in the last half of a chapter. That's about it. Now, that's a little oversimplification. There's hints of the answer strewn throughout the book. But for the most part, that's what it is. Now, who is giving us this book? Well, if you notice there in verse 1, it says, the words of the preacher. That phrase, the preacher, translates the ancient Hebrew word koheleth. And the idea is of someone who might gather or lead or speak to a group of people such as a congregation. The word is connected to the Hebrew idea of assembling or gathering together. And the suggestion is there of somebody who holds an office. Other people have attempted to translate this, such as the preacher, the speaker, the president, the spokesman. By the way, the idea translates into Latin, the person who speaks over a congregation, ecclesiastes, ecclesiastical meaning a congregation. And so what we have in this modern way of saying ecclesiastes, it just comes from the Latin title for the book. Now, these are definitely the words of the preacher, but this is an unusual preacher. This preacher doesn't talk a whole lot about God. He doesn't talk a lot about God directly. Matter of fact, this book has no mention of Yahweh, the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. Rather, the only possible reference to the Lord is in chapter 12, verse 13, and it seems to not refer to the nation of Israel. Why? And I think the reasons are clear. The preacher's arguments stand on their own feet. They don't depend on Israel's status as a chosen nation. He's appealing to universally observable facts. 
In other words, this is a book for everybody, not just Israel, but for us as well, and for anybody who lives their life under the sun. Again, going back to verse 1, he identifies himself, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. That identifies the preacher as David's son, Solomon. Now, there are some scholars who believe that somebody else wrote it in Solomon's name. But there's no compelling reason, in my mind, I should say, to say that anybody other than Solomon wrote it. Matter of fact, when you dig into the text, you can see that there are many indications and copies from earlier things that Solomon wrote, and so there's probably very little doubt, at least again, I should say in my mind, I find very persuasive that Solomon wrote this book. Matter of fact, he makes it even more clearly that he was the king in Jerusalem. David had several sons, but he only had one of them that succeeded him as king, and that was Solomon himself. But it's very significant and very important that King Solomon wrote this. Because he was a king, and he was a wealthy king, and he was a powerful king, and he was a king that had very little trouble on the foreign front. That means that it was a king of tremendous resources and tremendous freedom. He had the freedom, the resources, the wisdom, and the standing to write this book. I would suggest this to you, that only Solomon could have written this book. Because he had the wisdom and the resources to work through these problems. When we get to the preacher, we're talking about this man who was brilliant and almost unlimited. He's the one who's going to plumb the depths of human experience. And you know, Solomon can take you there because he has the resources. He can do this. Now, when Solomon wrote this book, he did so in a style that was appreciated in his day. This sort of uh, category of wisdom literature in the ancient Middle East at that time, it's well attested in the ancient world. Some people call it the pessimism literature. And this is the only example of this kind of literature in the Bible. Now, I find it also interesting to think that if King Solomon wrote this, why did he write it and when did he write it in his life? There are some people who think that Solomon wrote this late in his life as his statement of repentance. I wish I could say that confidently, but I have to tell you that from the text of the end of Solomon's life, found in 1 Kings chapter 11, there is no hopeful word about his repentance. It seems that Solomon died in a backslidden state. Oh, I believe he was saved. I believe you're going to see Solomon in heaven from how the word of God speaks to him. But friends, there is no mention in the historical passages of Scripture about Solomon coming back from this great season of backsliding. And so any assignment of this to being very late in his life and his statement of repentance, well, all I can say is that I hope so. But there's no real evidence for believing it. Now, after this brief introduction in verse 1, now we come to verse 2, where he sort of brings the problem out before us, and the problem is this, the meaninglessness of life. Verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The preacher begins his sermon with his first conclusion. Though make no mistake about it, this is not his ultimate conclusion. That's at the end of the book. But it is his first conclusion. Looking all around at life, he judges it to be vanity. What does that mean? It means nothing. It means useless. It means meaningless. The ancient Hebrew word comes from the word for a breath. That's how much substance, that's how much strength, that's how much power it has. It's nothing you can get your hands on. It's the nearest thing you can find to zero. That's the kind of vanity that this book is speaking about. Basically, it has the idea of being unreliable and frail, of being short and unsubstantial, and of being futile and to no effect. Now, if that's not bad enough, that the preacher stands up and he looks at life and he says, it's meaningless. He makes it even stronger. Look at what he says there. First of all, he uses the Hebrew expression, vanity of vanities. Do you know what that means? The ultimate vanity. When you talk in Hebrew, you talk about the song of songs, right? What do you mean the ultimate song? You say the holy of holies. What do you mean the ultimate holy place? When you say vanity of vanities, you're saying it as strong as you can. But the Hebrews had another way of expressing strength in their literature. It was by repetition. 
So you see what he says there in verse 2? Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Now, if that's not enough, he'll say it to you again. Vanity of vanities. He wants to get the message through. Man, I looked everywhere, and life was meaningless. And if he could put it any more strongly, he puts it at the end of verse 2. All is vanity. That Hebrew phrasing is very important and very expressive. He further strengthens the point at the very end by saying, all is vanity. You see, Solomon noted that not only is life vanity, but all is vanity. It seemed to him that every part of life suffered from this emptiness. Now, we see from the first two verses of the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon wrote this from a certain perspective, a perspective that runs throughout the book, and he will expose this perspective at the very end as being inadequate and wrong. But most all of Ecclesiastes is written in this perspective that he will later disprove. It's written through the eyes of a man who thinks and lives as if God does not matter. I'm going to say that again, because with those words, I just described most of the people you rub shoulders with every day. Most of the people you rub shoulders with every day live and think as if God does not matter. I didn't say they were atheists. No, they might believe there is a God. Statistically, most Americans do. Every year, what's it come out? This 95, 96, 97% of Americans believe there is a God. Oh, no, no, the world is filled with people who believe in God. But many or most of these people believe that God doesn't matter. And they live and they think independently of that idea. Ecclesiastes is written through the eyes of a man who thinks and believes that way. It's an absolutely accurate statement of life when it is lived under those certain conditions. But but it's not true of what a statement of life is necessarily like. If you say in response to me, well, listen, my life isn't vanity. My life isn't meaningless. My life is filled with meaning and purpose. That's wonderful. But you can't ignore the premise of the preacher, the premise of life under the sun. Listen, for some of you, boy, I can't believe I'm going to say this. It's not even in my notes, but I I feel it very strongly. For some of you, my job throughout the book of Ecclesiastes is to show you that your life is meaningless. You thought it had meaning, but actually the things you invested meaning in your life are things that really don't matter. No, there's one ultimate thing that gives meaning to our life, and that's not only God, but the fact that we answer to God in eternity. That's what Ecclesiastes will explore. You see, therefore, Ecclesiastes is filled with what we might call true lies. It is given the perspective, God does not matter, then it's true, all is vanity. But since that perspective is wrong, it is not true that all is vanity. Yet some people make us think, or excuse me, that Solomon makes us think through this perspective very thoroughly throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's move on now to verse 3, continuing on the idea. He says, What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Now, using language from the world of business, because that's what it is, he says, What profit has a man? Where's the profit? Show me the cost analysis. Where's the good? Where am I in the black and not in the red? What is my life? I know it's filled with labor, but what is it worth? What is it profit? In which he toils under the sun. Friends, this is the first use of a phrase that's essential in understanding the theme of Ecclesiastes. Look at it very carefully in verse 3, that phrase, under the sun. That phrase will be used some, oh, 29 times, I think, throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. And to my knowledge, nowhere else in the Hebrew Old Testament. The the, the phrase is going to be repeated many times in this book, but the idea doesn't mean on a sunny day, right? Oh, isn't it beautiful? We live in Santa Barbara. We have so many days under the sun. No, that's not the idea at all. It has nothing to do with the weather. The idea is this. In this world that we can see 
in this material world. It is life considered without an eternal perspective. And friends, I just ask you, if you take eternity out of it, then what profit has a man from all of his labor? Now again, you might say, well, my life has plenty of meaning. I, I, I do lots of, look what I accomplish. I accomplish this, I accomplish that. Solomon is dedicated to destroying your ideas of meaning in life apart from eternity. That's what he's going to save up to the end. And if you think that's depressing enough, well then look, let's hold on. Verse 4. One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down. It hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls around continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. You see, using several examples, the preacher observes that nothing really seems to change very much in this seemingly unending cycle of nature. I like what Alexander McLaren said about this, that great British preacher. Actually, he was a Scottish man. He said this. He looks out upon humanity and he sees that in one aspect, the world is full of births and another full of deaths. Coffins and cradles seem to be the main furniture of this world. And he hears the tramp, tramp, tramp of the generations passing over a soil honeycombed with tombs. I like that. The two major purses of furniture in this world are cradles and coffins. That's what it is. People are born and people die. That's it. And then he says, you see it in the creation. The sun also rises. The wind goes toward the south. The rivers run into the sea. From what Solomon could observe under the sun, these unchanging cycles express the unchanging monotony of life leading to its vanity and uselessness. Now, friends, I think in our modern age, we're numbed to this. You know what has numbed us to this realization? I think in a lot of ways, technology. Technology gives the illusion of newness. Oh, wow, did you hear about this? I got something new. I got a new computer. I got a new phone. I got a new software program. I got a new social networking thingy. I got this new. Friends, I, has it really changed your life? Is life substantially different for you? No, it's a diversion. I think we do a better job than ever diverting our minds from the meaninglessness of life. It's as if we're, we're, we're hamsters on the rotating cage, right? And we've just told ourselves, man, if I run faster and faster, that's what's going to make me progress. But you go nowhere. The things you're so impressed with technologically today, you're going to think are lame in two years. You're not going to be able to believe that people have such things. And I think people are in the Stone Age. You ever watch those old movies from the 1980s and see the guy in the cell phone that's about as big as a shoebox? <laughs> you look at those today and you laugh, right? You watch the movie from the 90s and the guy takes out a pager, right? You laugh, a pager? They used those back then? And then I'm trying to explain to my kids, you know, there was a time when I was growing up, people used phones that actually dialed. They, like, they can't believe it. It's like another world. But really, what, what, what does it really change in us? All it does is sort of give us a, a, a little ejection of adrenaline to, just to sort of jolt us into thinking, wow, this is new, this is great, but it changes nothing. The same cycles appear. People still live. People still die. People still fall in love. People still split up. People work their jobs and people lose their jobs. People have pain and people have some joys. Does it change anything substantial in life? Not in Solomon's mind and not in our own either. It's very interesting when you take a look at this idea in the Old Testament. Creation sings God's praises, doesn't it? Creation is out there shouting unto the Lord. But the preacher says, take away God and take away his eternal government of all things, and the creation no longer reflects his glory. You know, as one commentator named Eaton says, he says instead, it illustrates the weariness of mankind. Everything's just the same. 
friends, we recognize this, don't we? He continues on now, verse 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Wow, as he begins it right there in verse 8, he begins with this startling idea, all things are full of labor, man cannot express it. You see, Solomon then observed that the meaningless of life, it's not only reflected in nature with the way that the sun always does the same thing and the moon always does the same thing and the rivers always do the same thing. No, it's not only in nature, but it's also evident in human effort and endeavor. Despite all of man's working, all of his labor, all of his seeing, all of his hearing, he's still not satisfied. Tell me, my friend. Can you honestly tell me that you've never looked into your own soul when everything was good on the outside and seen the emptiness in your own soul? Have you never realized that there has to be something greater than yourself, greater than this temporal world? Well, Solomon understood it, and that's what he said. He said, it's still not satisfied. You tell me. Again, as Alexander McLaren observed, you tell me, what is the difference between that hamster in the cage going round and round and round and the man who lives his life working very hard for things that never he can attain and that will pass away as soon as he dies? There's not much difference, is there? And Solomon understands this. He says, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Despite all of man's work and progress, life seems monotonously the same. You don't think that's true? Listen to what are some of the most frequent words on the lips of young people and frequent words in the heart of modern man, not just young people, but older people as well. There's something within us, even with everything that we have, even with our old technology and the numb all of this, we still say it, do we not? I'm bored. Right? My friends, what possible reason do we have to be bored? I'll tell you why we're bored. Because God has put a void in our heart that can't be filled with the technological bells and whistles, that can't be filled with all the achievements and all the satisfaction of this world. God has put an empty place in our heart that can only be fulfilled, not just with him, but with him and who he is in eternity, with eternal God reigning in our hearts. Things seem new, but they get old very quickly, so they could be said, there's nothing new under the sun. Oh, and you got that new computer, didn't you? Wow, you know, it was the new release. It was the new release from Apple, wasn't it? And you were the ones who first in line. But you're smart enough. You didn't even have to wait in line, man. You got it first. And there you are. And oh, man, it was just amazing, right? How soon did it take for it to seem old? There's nothing new under the sun. As it's been said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss, right? Or I like this, what Derek Kidner said. In their new guise, the old ways go on as a race we never learn. And if that's not bad enough, what he says at the end of this section, what he says in verse 11, that there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come. You see, the futility of life seems to work in both directions, both into the past and then into the future. Man works hard. He does the best that he can, yet it never seems to make a lasting difference, and all is simply forgotten. Can I just depress you a little bit further? <laughs> it is shocking how soon people forget you. It just happens. Listen, nothing personal. 
It's just how life is. It's just as the writer to Ecclesiastes said. Well, Solomon throws all of this out. And he's not satisfied with it, right? He's taking a look at life and he goes, this is meaningless. This is wrong. It's not the way we're meant to be. Listen, if this is the way we're meant to be, then there would be something in me satisfied with this emptiness. I'd look at the emptiness. I'd look at the sense of meaninglessness and boredom. I'd say, yeah, okay, good. That's the way it's supposed to be. But there's something deep inside you and me and Solomon and all of us that says, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be different than this. And Solomon felt it deep within his soul. So he said, you know what? I'm going to investigate. I'm going to search the matter out. I'm going to try to find the meaning of life under the sun. Now, please remember, in these opening chapters, all the way through, almost exclusively, there's a few sprinklings of hope, but not much. But all the way through these first 11 and a half chapters, Solomon is considering life under the sun. And I'll remind you again what that is. Under the sun doesn't mean without God, but it means without God that matters. It means a life that's impacted by God with a view towards eternity. It's a life that says, one day I'm going to have to stand before God and give account. So he's going to search the matter out. Maybe I can find some meaning to life under the sun. Verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task that God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. And indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And what is lacking cannot be numbered. When we begin there at verse 12, we see Solomon reintroducing himself, right? I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, please remember, Solomon was internationally famous for his great wisdom. If the answers to the seemingly meaningless character of life could be found by wisdom, Solomon was the guy to find them. And Solomon's great wisdom was a gift of God. When God offered him whatever he pleased, he asked for wisdom, especially the wisdom to lead the people of God. That's in 1 Kings chapter 3. Therefore, God made Solomon so wise that he wrote thousands of Proverbs, and he was considered to be the wisest man in his part of the world in his day. So this extremely wise man, super qualified to launch out on this investigation, to try to find the meaning of life, this is what he said he did. Verse 13, I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. You see, having the unique ability to make this search, Solomon looked for the answers in wisdom, by which he meant human wisdom that excluded answers in light of eternity. Please understand, when he mentions in verse 13, by wisdom, he's not including wisdom that would have an eternal perspective. He's thinking of man's wisdom. Now, he was going to search it out the very best he could when he says there in verse 13, I set my heart to seek and to search out. Those two words in the ancient Hebrew, they're not synonymous. The the, the first one implies penetrating into the depth of an object. The the other word has the idea of taking a comprehensive survey. He says, I'm going to search both in the particular and in the general. I'm going to search it out to try to find wisdom. But again, as I would remind you, this is the wisdom that does not take into account man's eternal responsibility. This is the wisdom of those who guide us to a better life in the here and now. How to live a healthier, happier, and more prosperous life. This is the wisdom of the self-help section in your local bookstore, right? Now listen, this wisdom certainly has value. And many lives would be better for following it, right? How many of us would be better if we took that just good everyday under the sun wisdom on how to manage our money better? on how to lose some weight, on how to learn another language, all those kind of things, we'd be better off for it. But listen, those will not answer the question of the meaninglessness of life. 
You see, if it excludes a true appreciation of eternity and our responsibilities in the world to come, this wisdom has no true answer to the meaningless of life. It only shows us how to live your meaningless life better. So congratulations. You now have a better meaningless life. And so he says, I set my heart, verse 13, to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. And again, he's not thinking of God's heaven in eternity here. He's thinking of the blue sky and the starry sky. It's just another sort of poetic way of saying under the sun. He said, I did look at that. And then he says, under heaven, this is the burdensome task that God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. Do you understand what verse 13 is telling us? It's telling us that this seemingly futility of life comes from God. He has given it to man. I'll read it to you again. Let's look at verse 13 one more time. I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. You see, God has not only given you the sense that you lack meaning in your life, but he's also given you the sense that you can search it out if you'll search after it. God has deliberately built a system where life seems meaningless and vain without the understanding of a living, active God to whom we much give account. Now, friends, it might seem cruel of God to devise such a system, but actually, it's evidence of his great love and mercy. Do you realize that God has built within you? He put it in you. God has built within you the desire and the need for that which is going to bring meaning and fulfillment in your life. He did that. He built you wanting it. He built you needing it. Just like Augustine wrote, he said that the Creator made a God-shaped space in each one of us that can only be filled with Him, and our hearts are restless until they find their home in Him. My friends, this is not only true of us as people, but it's also true as creation, because creation itself was subjected to this futility until one day God brings its promised fulfillment. But at the same time, make no mistake about it, verse 13 tells us that it is a burdensome task. It isn't always easy to find these answers because of our pride, because of our self-reliance, and because our self-love, they all work against God's key to finding meaning in our life. And in this depressed examination, Solomon says in verse 15, he looks around at the world and he says, what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. The preacher's initial search for answers in wisdom under the sun brought him only despair. You know, one of the tough things about the book of Ecclesiastes is the preacher's just a little bit too honest for us, isn't he? He's very quick to tell us the results. I looked around, I did all this searching, and you know what? Nothing. Zero. Here's the results of my exhaustive search to try to find meaning and fulfillment in this world under the sun. Here's my results. Ready? What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. What's wrong can never be set right, and the things that are wrong are so great that they can't be numbered. But then, verse 16, Solomon sort of rallies himself. He says, wait a minute. i got to try again. i got to try more, right? There's got to be a solution to this problem. So he looks for it right here, verse 16. I communed with my heart, saying, look, I've attained greatness, and I've gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. And I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I perceive that this is also grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. By the way, it's very interesting how he begins verse 16, isn't it? I communed with my heart. This is natural for anyone who looks for the answers 
under the sun apart from an eternal perspective. They look inward for wisdom and answers instead of the God who rules eternity. Friends, if you commune with your heart and look for the answers, which, by the way, is the majority way of finding the answers for life in the world today. How are most people guided? How do you look for the rules of your life? How will you decide what's right and what's wrong? What do they say? They say, well, I just look within. I look to my own heart. I look for my own wisdom. I let my own self be my guide, whatever. Well, friends, that's vanity. That's grasping after the wind. How much better to have this eternal perspective that Solomon would eventually come to? He says there very plainly in verse 17, excuse me, in verse 17, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this is also grasping for the wind. It's like, okay, this, the, the first time I did this great wisdom for search, no, nothing came out. I found that everything that's crooked can't be made straight and what's lacking can't be numbered. I got to look again. I got to search harder. And what did he say? No, it's also grasping for the wind. Uh, uh, the solutions to his life, it wasn't to think harder. It wasn't to think better. That also was all grasping for the wind. Why? Because he says in verse 18, for in much wisdom is much grief and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. The more the preacher understood life, under the sun, the greater his despair. The more he learned, the more he realized he didn't know, and the more he knew, the more he knew life's sorrows. Friends, if you're going to restrict life to under the sun, without an eternal perspective, you're stuck in the same place. The very best you can find is how to live a better, meaningless life. Now, I want to draw your minds in conclusion because we're going to have to end off here and begin with chapter 2 the next time. What he says in verse 9, that which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. My friends, here's the good news that I have to give you. There is something new in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Solomon is writing from a very important perspective that we need to enter into even more deeply in the coming weeks than we've entered into tonight. There may be nothing new under the sun, but thankfully the followers of Jesus, those who are born again by God's Spirit, they don't live under the sun in that sense. Their life is filled with new things. You want to know that you can have new in Jesus Christ? I'll just name off a few. You can have a new name. You can have a new community. You can have a new commandment. You can have a new covenant. You can have a new and living way to heaven. You can have a new purity. You can have a new nature. You can be a new creation in Jesus Christ. And as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Revelation 21.5, all things become new. You see, Solomon's just setting us up for what the answer should be. And friends, the answer is to find the newness of life in Jesus Christ. But Solomon is not going to let us off so easy. He sort of demands, if I could say this, to destroy any illusion of hope that we have apart from God. But fortunately, in Jesus Christ, we have great hope and great newness of life. You know, before... Jesus was crucified. He held out before his disciples saying, and he said, I'm making the new covenant in my blood. He makes all things new for his people. Friends, if this uh, first chapter of Ecclesiastes has hit a little close to home for you, and you seem to be experiencing more of that meaninglessness of life than the meaningful life that Jesus Christ wants to give you, tonight's the night for you to come before God and ask him, Lord, make things new. I understand that true newness can't be mine apart from the eternal, apart from who Jesus is and what he did on my behalf. That's where newness is. Listen, you've been trying to find something new, but by having a new job, but by having a new romance, but by having a new toy in your life, but by having a new place that you visit. But all that's getting old, isn't it? 
What you need is the newness that Jesus Christ brings into your life. And then you'll find with him making all things new in your life, you can enjoy some of those things because you're not looking to them for ultimate fulfillment anymore. He brings the meaning to our lives.